Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. I hope everybody's having a wonderful day. So today we're going to be picking up from where we were last day, where I first introduced you push down automata. So these are a generalization of epsilon NFAs. And I'm going to, my goal here is to show you how they work. In particular, I want to show you how you can use these so-called PDAs or push down automatons or a singular push down automaton. Um, how I can use to describe context free languages to you. So last day I started defining what a push down automaton was. But I stopped right at where I was talking about what the output of the transition function is. Now we're calling the epsilon NFA. We had it where we returned a set of states just like an NFA does. But we permitted these epsilon moves in the epsilon NFA. So you should expect that this thing will definitely put out a set of states. But remember, in the PDA, we also have this stack. So we have a description that depends on a state and the current state of the stack. So there's two things that are in play at the moment. So naturally, this is going to get encoded into what we look at for a given configuration of the machine. So what do I mean by the transition function? So recall it's a triple where I have Q, A, and X. So where did my marker go? Ah, here we are. Let's use this one. So remember, Q is a state. A is an input symbol. And X is a stack symbol. So remember, we had a set of stack symbols. So the output of this will be a finite set of pairs. So P and gamma. So this is lowercase gamma. Where P is going to be the set, uh, sorry, the, the state that you're going to be transitioning to. And gamma is going to be the string of stack symbols that replace X at the top of the stack. So remember I talked about this last day where the intuition was that I have this stack and I can push and pop it. This is why we call it a push down automaton is because I push down and I, on my stack. Just like I can push and pop, this, the push part is about the stack. That's what we're, that's really what we're going to be using a lot for this push down automaton. So, so if the X is the top of the stack, gamma is going to be what replaces it. So just as an example, if gamma were epsilon, this is how we pop the stack. If gamma is equal to the top of the stack, that means that the stack doesn't change. All I've done is I've just swapped gamma with X and it stays the exact same. If gamma, however, were say two symbols, for example, say Y and Z, then what happens is X gets replaced by Z. So now the top of the stack is no longer X, now it's Z, and then I push Y onto the stack. So as a convention, when people write out the stack, in these descriptions or pairs, what it is is that we always read from left to right what this should look like. And that also applies to the stack itself. So if I gave you a stack, the top of the stack would appear on the leftmost side of the string. And as I read to the right, that goes more and more towards the bottom of the stack. You're going to see this in our examples today. So does everybody understand the idea of like what the output of this thing should look like? So it should give you a state and what the string of stack symbols will be for replacing the top of the stack. So it's not just a, sta a state anymore. Now it's actually a pair where it's a state and what we're going to replace on the top of the stack. So if you're wondering again why this epsilon would pop the stack, remember I replaced the top symbol on the stack with whatever gamma is. And if gamma is the empty string, then I've eliminated X. So it serves the purpose of popping the stack. So does everybody see that? It's, it's, it's actually quite clever if you think about it. Uh, so it's just doing some replacement of the string that's on the top of the stack. So you're gonna very often find that when we do this, you're gonna find that what's on the top of the stack is gonna play a very important role of how we describe the PDA. Okay, so 
If we're good with that, let me move to an example so you can actually see how we're going to use this. So I want to go revisit that example I did last day. So remember last day I had this idea and I gave you this high level description of how I can get the context free language that is as and so I had two set two symbols like I think I had zero and one where the number of zeros matches the number of ones in the string. So what I want to do is I want to design the PDA a little bit more formally this time, actually quite a bit more formally. Uh, so let's do an example here. So I'm going to let PDA P be equal to remember I have seven seven. This is a seven tuple Q Sigma capital gamma Delta Q zero Z zero and F where where now I'm going to define it this way. So I have to do this once so you can see for sure like, OK, this is how I define a PDA for if I gave you an arbitrary one. So I just want to make sure you, we do this at least once so you get the appreciation for it. So I'm going to have three states, Q0, Q1 and Q2. Uh, I'm going to have the set of input symbols B0 and 1. Capital gamma is going to be the start symbol and an X. So remember, we talked about how we're going to push sim X's onto a stack, right? This is that X I'm referring to. That's what I said last day. So Q0 is the start state. And Z0 is the start symbol. And the, the final state, the set of final states is just going to be simply equal to Q2. So Q2 is going to be a final state. So now all I have to do is define what delta is. Now, I'm to make it a little bit more careful for how we use these pairs, I'm going to describe to you how I'm going to design this PDA to be a little bit more careful when I do it. So. I'm not going to just list them straight out and just to say, hey, look, you just got to expect it. I will accept it. I don't like that idea because it's a little bit more complicated, right? I've introduced a whole other set of constructions here where we talk about configurations of the machine as opposed to just a state. Um, so now I got, I'm going to define. Uh, so, let, so next, let us define. Define delta. By the way, when I talked about the push down automaton, uh, when I say push down, like you can think of it like a stack of trays. So what do you do with a stack of trays? You push it down like there's it's a mechanism of trays. Like I don't want to get into it in case you've never seen like trays at like a, a mall or just like standard like food trays. But this is a typical thing they do. They push, you stack them like plates, but they also it's also that they get pushed down. That's uh, but yeah, uh, I just feel like mentioning these things. It's always a little little bit of an Easter egg of sorts. Let us define Delta. So I want to kind of walk you through how I'm going to go through each part of this. So this just makes it a little easier. Uh, let us define Delta by the following rules. So I'm going to go over to that board and we're going to walk through these because I want to make sure that you have an idea of where the heck all this stuff came together. OK, so let's try this. So just keep in mind, keep in mind how the transition function works. We're going to get more nitty gritty as we drill down of how exactly all this fits together and as we proceed. I just think it's important that you see like one full proper done example so that you can get a motivation for how you would try doing this yourself. So here's an idea. Here's an idea. So I want to come back to the three phase idea I did last day. So remember, I had these three phases of sorts, right? I had that first phase where I allow you to start start reading a whole bunch of zeros, right? So my goal was I read a bunch of zeros. I push the X onto the stack, right? I do this each time I read a zero and then I, I allowed myself either to stay in that state 
or phase. And then I move into reading ones. And I could pop off x's whenever I see a one. I can make a move to do this, or I could keep reading in more, more zeros. You're gonna find that this this sort of this this epsilon NFA behavior will still exhibit here, but you have to be a bit more careful because now there's also a stack involved. They are entwined with each other. So that's why I always refer to not just a state. Now I talk about a whole configuration of the machine. There's a state and also what the stack's top looks like. So at the start, at the start, if a zero is red, we push x onto the stack. Right, that's that makes sense from what I just said and what we did last day. So I'm going to define delta q zero because that's the start state. I read a zero, and I have the start symbol on the stack when I start this thing up. That's where the start symbol appears. It always will be on the stack right at the beginning. So just like when I have q zero as a start state, this stack this this will start off on the PDA. So now I need to define a set of pairs for you. So what does it mean for me to push x onto the stack? Well, it means I'm going to show you. Okay, well, I have, have it like this. So notice that this will allow me to push x onto the stack. So now notice that now x has been pushed onto the stack. I didn't replace z0 because I want to keep z0 there. So there's two ways this could happen where I'm reading in a zero. There's a possibility that I've already read one zero. But could somebody tell me what should the stack look like if I read already at least one zero? What's at the top of the stack? If I took a peek at the top of the stack, what should be there? If I write at least one zero already, what symbol should be sitting there? Well, it shouldn't be at a Z zero because I've read at least one, one zero, right? It, an X, an X, perfect, perfect. So an X should be there. So if I take a peek at the top of the stack, there should be an X there. So if I see another zero, remember, I want to push another X on there. So I want to keep the X that I had there already. So I'm going to not replace that top of the stack, but I want to push another X on. So remember, this is where the top of the stack is. I can either replace it or I can push more symbols on. In this case, I want to keep it and then I want to push another X on. So notice I'm staying in Q0 when I'm doing this. So this is, this is essentially my phase one from last class. As I keep reading in zeros, I can push an X onto the stack each time I read a zero. But I need some way to move from my phase one from last day to phase two. Then the PDA may take an epsilon move to Q1, where ones may be read. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take advantage of the fact that this is, does have the functionality of an epsilon NFA, so I can make epsilon moves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Q0, because that's the state I am currently in. Then I read, I use an epsilon move. Now, there's two possibilities that can happen. I could have read at least one zero, meaning there's an X at the top of the stack, but there may have been the case that I didn't read any zeros. So I might stand up with the start symbol at the top of the stack at the moment. So I transition 
or move. Usually that's the language of the PDA because I'm moving from one configuration of the machine to another. I move to Q1. I need a comma right there where the stack indeed doesn't change. It's just dead zero. So I'm just moving to Q1. Same idea again, Q0, Epsilon. But remember, like I said, you could have read at least one, one of these, one of those zeros, which means I pushed an X. So I go Q1 and then the top of the stack will look like an X. So notice that here, there's a lot that could be going on with the stack itself, but I'm only concerning myself with the top of the stack. Do you see that? So the one thing you need to be careful about is that these epsilon moves don't actually consume symbols. So that means that I basically move over to another spot and then now I can just like, okay, well, I didn't consume a symbol, but I moved over to another state. Now, this is where we have our phase two. Next, we pushed, we pushed some X's previously. Now we pushed, next we pushed some X, X's previously. We pop when, when, when the input reads a one. When I read a one, I better pop the stack. So what do we do? So now this is, believe it or not, all you need to do. So, okay, I'll address your question in one moment. So let me just, so let me just note down what this transition is. So I can stay in Q1. So I'm on Q1. So I'm right now, I'm, I, if I read a one, I only want this to occur if I see an X. So what happens is if this is the case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stay in Q1 and then I'm going to pop the stack, meaning that the gamma part is epsilon. So to answer the question, so the question is when the epsilon is read, uh, the stack get popped. Uh, so what? Uh, so so do we still have X? So now I must stress that the stack didn't get popped when we moved on the epsilon move. Uh, this epsilon here relates to the state. So this is so remember the second part here is in fact the state that I'm referring to. So when I use an epsilon, remember. This is just like the epsilon NFA. I get to go for free from one state to another. Now, in contrast, the way epsilon gets used for the stack is like in this transition here. So notice here that when I read a one, it instructs me to pop the stack. So I'm going to replace the top of the stack, which would be an X with now I'm going to, I'm just going to replace the top of the stack with epsilon, but that's, that's a string with no symbols, right? That's how we pop the stack. But, but so that being said, when I do these moves, I don't touch the stack. Here I do though. Notice that the replacement rule is just, notice it's the exact same as the presence of the top of the stack. So when I read off the top of the stack, I just see, yeah, no, they haven't changed. Here it does though. Does that clarify for your question? Is that, notice here that, that this is one thing you have to get used to is the fact that there's you have this epsilon that functions as a way I can move from one state to another, just like the epsilon NFA. But now I can use epsilon also in another context to talk about the stack being pushed or popped. In this case, being popped. So this is the second part of, so this would have been the phase two of the high level description I gave you last day. So now whenever I see an X at the top of the stack, when I read a one, I better pop it. <laughs> That's what it's saying. So now you might, okay, you might say, well, what do we do after this? Finally, if we are in state, if we are in state Q1 and the top of the stack 
the top of the stack is Z0. It means, it means no X's are present. So go to, go to the final state. So go to the final state. So the whole trick here, the way I'm gonna design this PDA is that if I end up with Z0 being the top of the stack again, when I'm in Q1, that means I have no X's. But why do I push an X? It's because I read a zero in the first, in, in Q0. So the whole idea here is that I'm gonna just transition from Q1 on epsilon when the top of the stack is indeed a, is Z0. I'm gonna go to Q2 and I'm not gonna do anything with my stack. I'll just leave it as Z0. And believe it or not, this is the entire description of delta. So I must stress that this, these explanations here are to help you justify each one of our transitions here. The description of delta itself is this, this, that, and there. So that's how you do the, remember when we did our DFAs and NFAs and I defined it where we did it straight from Delta itself. This is how the, the equivalent of that is for the PDA. So you might ask Dan, well, what happens when, when it doesn't match this config, like say it doesn't look like this. Well, it's very much just like an Epsilon NFA where if you don't have a valid move, you can go from to one configuration to another. It's just like in the Epsilon NFA, it's just going to die or get killed, just like a thread, just like we did before the Epsilon NFA. So I wanna show you what this looks like and I'm gonna give you a much more exact way of describing this. Uh, but I need to describe how we're going to do our transition diagram because before we had transition diagrams and they also were rather helpful for us. So I'm gonna give you a generalized transition diagram that allows me to describe for you the PDA. Now, just as a small remark, some people define the PDA ever so slightly. Uh, for example, Sipser defines the PDA uh, so that the start of the stack starts off actually with no symbols on it at all. Uh, I'm adopting a convention where that start symbol always appears at the beginning. That's mostly as a nice, it's a feature that makes it a little easier to work with. Because once, as soon as you have it where the stack can be empty completely on its own, right at the start, there's a lot of things that can happen. There's also another technical reason that I may have time to talk about later. We'll see, I'm not sure. We may talk about briefly next time. Okay, so let me talk about our transition diagrams. So I'm just gonna describe how the transition diagram is gonna look for a PDA. This is the convention that we're going to use. So we're gonna have nodes or vertices that are the states. So that's not too much different, right? We've done that before. Likewise, an arrow. An arrow, as before. Labeled, labeled start, pointing at the start state. Pointing at the start state. Pointing at the start state. Then we, of course, we doubly circle, circle final states. So that isn't any different, right? We haven't done anything different than we did before. This is just the exact same way we did things with our transition diagrams already. Now, now, now this is gonna be where it changes. It's how we label the arcs, or our edges, or transitions, however you would like to call them. Arcs, which are transitions, 
transitions of the PDA. So now here's the convention we're going to use for labeling these, these arcs. So we're going to label them as follows. So we're going to have an A, then an X, then have a slash, and then an alpha here. I'm going to label, tell you what each one of these is. This is the, so what A is, A is, is the input red. So I must stress that obviously this is just whatever the input was. It doesn't necessarily have to be a symbol that gets consumed off the input. It could be epsilon, right? What X is, uh, this is going to be the old top of the stack. And then alpha, alpha is just simply going to be the new top of the stack. And now you might ask well, how you draw the arc. Uh, an arc goes, goes from, from state P to Q implies delta P A X contains hair Q alpha. So if you're wondering what the A, X, and the alpha are, they are the exact ones I'm describing here. So A is they, X is X, and alpha here is, is that alpha. Now, one thing I can mention as a bit of a drawback about the transition diagrams in a PDA is unfortunately, notice that I didn't say anywhere where Z0, what Z0 is. So often the convention, like I said, is that Z0 is the uh, start symbol is assumed Uh, assume Z0 unless stated otherwise. So for example, if you fully defined your PDA and then you gave a different name for the start symbol, this would be what the start symbol will be for your PDA. But if you do not give me a description of that seven tuple, I'll just assume that there's a Z0 that's at the top of your stack right at the beginning. So that's just one drawback about these transition diagrams is there's no natural place where Z0 sits in the picture. So are we okay so far? I'm gonna show you a picture of one of these actually looks like. So I encourage you as I'm explaining this to look back at your notes and look at what the picture looks like. And you're gonna see that there's gonna be a very natural way you're gonna read these with respect to that transition and what the pair looks like and how the transition diagram pops out. You're gonna say, Dan, why didn't you show me this first? <laughs> it's because I need to make sure you see how all these little bits and bits come together. So watch this, watch this. So let me just move on over here. Okay. So let's, uh, let's draw our picture for the PDA that I've just defined previously. So remember, I'm gonna have three states. So I have Q0, Q1, and Q2. I already know Q2 is a final state, so I'm gonna label that. And I already know Q0 is the start state. I already know it's the start state. So, what I'm going to do now is I need to put all the transitions in. Now you recall, 
I had a transition that kept me from in Q0 to Q0. That was the one for which I was reading in zeros, right? So now I know I need to label this loop here with all of the possible moves that can occur for this move from one to the other configuration. But these are my transitions here. So let me label this. So remember, I had it where I read a zero. Then what I did was I had the top of the stack being Z0 originally. And then what I did is I pushed an X onto the stack. So remember, this is, this is the symbol I read. This is the old stack top. This is the new stack top. So that's one of the two transitions. The other one was, of course, where I read a zero and the top of the st old stack top looks like just an X, so I pushed two Xs. So remember, this is the top, new top of the stack is this first symbol. This is the one that used to be the old stack top. So that's how I label those transitions for this arc here. So far, are we doing okay? Give me a thumbs up if we're doing okay. So, so far I've described one, well, two, a pair of transitions. Okay, great, great, wonderful. Like I said, this looks a little bit more involved, but I'm hoping that you'll have a little bit of a better flavor for this once you see it a little bit more pictorially. <laughs> so now here's my epsilon move. Remember I said that, oh, if you see the top of the stack is Z0, then you better keep it so it's Z0. So you can go to Q1. Or I can have it where if the top of the stack is an X, I better keep it as the top of the stack being an X. Then I have my second self loop on Q1. Now, just to be a little bit careful, uh, there, it should be right here, but I just want to make sure I'm not overlapping things too much here for you. Uh, this will be, of course, where I read a one. And then the top of the stack is, in fact, an X. I pop the stack. So I have epsilon right there. So that's what I would label right here. And then of course I have my epsilon move here if the top of the stack is in fact Z0, my start symbol. And believe it or not, that is the transition diagram for our PDA. Are there any questions about what I did here with this transition diagram? So. Just as a reminder, this PDA recognizes this language. It recognizes, it re recognizes zero to the n, one to the n, where n is greater or equal to zero. So just to, if you really need to convince yourself of this, remember, it could be the case that there are no zeros or ones. So we need these epsilon moves to get me from Q0 to Q1, then from Q1 to Q2. So if I have no symbols, it should, it should accept the empty string, right? So if I were to go, whoop, I want some way I can quickly go from phase one to phase two to phase three. Um, but yeah, this is why we need to make sure we have this in place, is we need to make sure that when we're done reading zeros, if, there, if we don't read any zeros, we need to be able to make sure we can get to this final state over here. But yeah, so this is the PDA for recognizing this language. Is that kind of neat? So I want to do another example with you. So let's give this a try. So this is an example I will use a few more times. So, so let's make sure we do this correctly. So we're going to be talking about even length palindromes. So if you recall, I gave you this actually as an extra example in the notes. Uh, for showing a language wasn't regular. So I'm going to show you that, yes, indeed, like, like we've seen, we, we've seen a context-free grammar for this that actually allows you to say, hey, look, this is actually a context-free language. So I'm going to show you a PDA for this language. So here's the, so we're going to, uh, let's consider another, another PDA. That recognizes that recognizes strings from the language from the language 
from the language. I'm going to write it a little differently. So I'm going to write W, W, R. Remember the R means reversal. Such that W is just some string of zeros and ones. So what I'm going to do, and actually I, I have a question for you. Remember, and even like palindrome, it means that I read the string and then I have to be able to read it in reverse immediately after that. So you know it's going to be have an even length. So if I give you, say, say uh, A, B, C, then you know most certainly the rest of the string should be C, B, A, right? So I want you to think about this. We actually have an idea that's very similar to this one, where we read a whole bunch of zeros, and then we read a whole bunch of ones. Maybe we could use the same kind of mechanism that we used before and just build on it. So does anybody have any ideas? So before, just as a reminder, what I did was whenever I countered zeros, I pushed X's onto the stack. Yes, yes, so so that's a, that's a very good place. That's exactly where I want us to go. <laughs> very good suggestion. So now instead of just having one symbol like we had for X, we can have two symbols. Maybe I'll call them X and Y. Now keep in mind, you might ask, Dan, why are you using X and Y? It's just to illustrate a point, but keep in mind, you can also have the stack alphabet be literally the same as the input symbols. They don't have to be disjoint from one another. So if you wanted to have it where you're pushing zeros and ones onto the stack, that's okay. I'm just using it just to illustrate a point. Uh, but yeah, you have exactly the right idea. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have it so that I'm going to push X's whenever I see a zero and whenever I see a one, I'm going to push a, a Y. And naturally you can use the very similar idea I just used over here. So notice that whenever I read a one, I popped the stack. So now all I have to do is I need to consume the symbols, but I want to make sure that they get consumed in reverse order for the second phase. But the great part is, okay, well, if I know what this top of the stack should look like at that given time, well, here, remember, whenever I read a one, that was only because I wanted to match it with a zero. So naturally, if ever I see a one, I should maybe expect a Y to be at the top of the stack. And whenever I see an X in that second part, I better see an X. So that's a very good idea. So let's proceed with this idea. Uh, so. Here's another PDA. I'm going to define it again, but I'm just going to go a little more swiftly here. Period. Uh, let PDA, and I'm going to call it PPAL. And it's going to also have three states, Q0, Q1, Q2. Its input symbols are going to be a zero and a one. Its stack symbols are going to be an X, a Y, and Z0. Z0. Then I'm going to have delta, and then I'm going to have Q0, Z0, and then my final state's going to be Q2 again. So I'm just going to take the same idea, and I'm just extending it. Where, where delta is defined is defined by the following transition diagram. So I got to draw you a fun transition diagram. Now, I'm just going to make sure I have enough space for this. So let me let me just get rid of this right here. And I should have enough space. You might ask Dan, why Why do you think you're going to need so much space? It's because remember, whenever I push symbols now, I'm not just caring only about, about zeros. Now I have to care about ones too. So I'm, you're going to notice that I have to consider all possible weight configurations of the top of the stack. 
So all possible ways the top of the stack could look. So let's take a look here. So looky, looky, uh, let me draw it here. So I'm gonna have my start here. So I'm Q0, I'm gonna make sure I give myself a little bit more space. Q1 and Q2. And remember Q2 is a final state, so I'll make sure I label that. You know I'm gonna have it where I'm gonna switch between these states. What's gonna be really interesting is of course, what happens in between them and what's gonna happen at a given state. Now, you know right away that the idea is I'm going to push symbols onto the stack and now my goal is to make Q1 consume as many symbols as it possibly can. So it matches each corresponding Y with a one and every zero with an X. So when I'm done, I wanna make sure that this thing only has the start symbol at the end so that it can reach this final state. So I know this right away. That's the same thing I had over there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of go backwards just to make this a little bit more clear where I'm getting this idea from. So remember, I told you that every time I'm going to read a zero, I'm going to try to get rid of one of those X's. And whenever I read a one, I better get rid of one of these Y's. So I wanna pop them. Now, you might ask Dan, why do we care about the order in which they come in? I want you to remember how a stack works. So remember, when I push items onto a stack, for example, like this. So for example, just for the sake of discussion, imagine I gave you a whole bunch of X's. I have like X, 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 Y like this. And I push each one of these onto the stack. So it'll go X, 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 Y. When I pop, uh, if I pop each one of the symbols off this stack, am I gonna get them as X, 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 Y? Is that the order I'm going to get them? No, I'm going to get them in what order? <laughs> yes, you're going to get them in reverse. Exactly. 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 That's what we're going to take advantage of. So that's what I'm going to take advantage of here. So when I push symbols onto the stack, the goal is if I get an even like palindrome, every time I see the top of the stack, whenever I see that one, I wanna make sure I can pop it. Whenever I see an X, I wanna make sure I pop it. But the order I'm going to pop these things is gonna end up being a sequence that's in reverse of what the original string was. And that's how we're using it here. That's exactly the property we wanna take advantage of is the fact it's a stack. So whenever I push something on, I want to, it's kind of a, I'm like, I'm not sure if some people would get this analogy, but like, I'm not sure how many of you have had a VCR or a VHS tape, but the analogy would be that I would like to rewind. So if I was watching a movie and I want to rewind the movie, I would rewind the tape. I'm doing the exact same thing here. I'm just literally rewinding the entire state of the machine. By every time I look at the stack, I want to rewind them by popping off the things I pushed on. I guess rewind works perfectly fine. We still have those these days. <laughs> uh, I just like it because you literally can watch the tape rewinding on a TV, depending on what your VCR is capable of. Um, or DVD player. It also works with DVD players. I'm really dating myself a little bit, but I'm not, I assure you, I'm not that old. <laughs> um, so let me... Uh, I'm having fun with this, of course. I'm just playing a little bit here. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to first consider my initial cases where, okay, I read a zero. Whenever I read a zero, I better push an X. And whenever I read a one, I'm going to push a Y. So just remember, I read the stack from left to right. Whenever, even if I'm pushing them, if I read the stack off, for example, this one I would read as y, x, x, x. But remember, this is just saying, this is what the old stack's top looks like. This is the new top of the stack. So I'm pushing y. Okay, so now I have four more rules that are all gonna somehow fit in here. So I'm going to have two of them for which I'm reading in a zero, and two of them where I'm going to be reading in ones because I'm going to potentially have it where X is at the top of the stack or Y is on the top of the stack for each one of reading a zero and a one. 
So I want to make sure I can pair these off. So, so if I have it where the top of the stack is an X, or the top of the stack is a Y, the top of the stack is an X, or the top of the stack is a Y. Why? Because I need to make sure I'm able to push my symbols, right? So if I see a top of the stack is an X, I just push another X. If I see a Y at the top of the stack, I'm going to push an X on top of the stack. If I have an X, I better, when I read a one, I better push a Y on top of the stack. It's got to be fun listening to me saying this over and over again. Um, y, I just push another Y on top of the stack. So believe it or not, everything I have here except for that one, everything is here. Now, recall, I want to use the same idea because remember, I could be potentially given an empty string. So I want to make sure I can still get to Q2 regardless if nothing happens at any of these loops here. So I have that one in place just in case. On an epsilon move, it may be the case that X is the top of the stack. I want to allow that to happen. It may be the case that Y is the top of the stack. I want to allow that to happen. So notice that the way I'm defining a lot of these transitions in my diagram, you'll notice that, that when I define things, I'm defining the configuration of the machine permissibly. So notice that when I say that, I mean just like when I talked about the Epsilon NFA, I'm only describing valid moves from one state to another based on two things, the state itself, but also the top of the stack. So it's two things you have to keep track of. They do not operate separately on the push down automaton, but they are indeed two separate things. That's why we have to keep them together when we're doing our transitions. So are there any questions about my transition diagram here? Are we all good? I just, uh, isn't this neat? So, so, now, so now we have some way that we can talk about context-free languages, but now with a more algorithmic description of how we can recognize them. Well, when I say algorithm, I mean more algorithmic, literally, uh, in the context versus the context-free grammar, which also does have an algorithmic aspect, but this is more algorithmic because um, it's literally a machine. Uh, but, but yeah, so when we come back, I'm going to give us a way we can characterize these, what I refer to as configurations. So notice I've talked about configurations as I go from one configuration to another, where I have a state and the top of the stack. I want some way of formalizing this so I can talk about how the machine accepts, because we've only been making the assumption that we know that we reach that final state when we consume all the symbols, right? That's sort of the assumption we've had up to this point. I want to formalize that and then we'll proceed from there, okay? So that being said, I wanna say thank you very much and have yourself a beautiful day. I'll see you later.